to find the center of mass of a, a regularly shaped object, like this block of wood, it's nice and rectangular, uniform density, same thickness throughout. The center of mass of an object like this is at its geometric center. So for this, I can just take my ruler, I can draw a diagonal from one corner to the other, and draw another diagonal from the other corner. And where the two lines intersect, that's going to be my center of gravity of this object. What I'll do is, I'll just take a nail and I'll insert it into the center of gravity. Now I'm going to take this string that has a weight on it. This is called a plumb bob. Anything I hang it from, this will hang straight down, of course, because of gravity, and that'll show me the direction of down. And now I can see the point about which the center of gravity is directly over, right above that yellow uh, piece of string. If I take the block and tip it, as long as the center of mass stays on this side of the support point, right here is where the block is touching the table, as long as the center of mass is on this side of the support point, the block is going to continue to fall to that side. I'll keep tipping it until you find, and you'll notice that as soon as the string passes onto the other side of the support point, that's when the block will tip over. The next object that we'll find the center of mass of is an irregularly shaped block. You'll see I've cut a corner out of this one, so it's no longer a nice, sh nicely shaped rectangle. Now what I've done is I've, I've hammered a nail into it so that I can support the block by the nail. I know that the center of mass will always hang below the point of support. If I make it so that the center of mass is not below the point of support, when I release it, it swings back so that the center of mass is always below the point of support. So what I'll do is, I'll take my plumb bob, I'll hang it from the nail, And now I know that my center of mass is somewhere along that line. So I'll draw a point where the string is. And then I'll connect that point with my ruler. So now I know the center of mass is somewhere on that line. Now I've moved the nail to another spot on the board. Again, I'll put my plumb bob on the nail. I'll hang the board from the nail, and I know that my center of gravity is somewhere on that vertical line. So I'll draw another dot where the line is. I'll connect space between the nail and the dot with my ruler. And now I know where the lines intersect. That's going to be my center of gravity. And to check that out, I should be able to balance the object at the center of gravity. And in fact, that is where it is. The object should spin well about the center of gravity. So what I've done is, I've driven a nail right into the center of gravity, and even though this is a very irregularly shaped object, since I know this is the center of gravity, it should spin very nicely about that point. Let's try the toppling experiment with the irregularly shaped block. I'll hang my plumb bob, and I know that the center of gravity now is above a point of support and the block is stable. If I put it this way, again, the center of gravity is above a point of support and the block is stable. However, if I put the block this way, 
you notice that the yellow string is just a tiny bit to the left of the last point of support right here. So that creates a small lever arm distance which produces a torque and the block tips over. Here's an interesting object. It's just a piece of wood with a hole in it and it's beveled to be flat on both ends at an angle and I can take my bottle, put it through there and it balances. What does this tell me about the center of mass or the center of gravity of this system? Well I know that the center of mass of the wood and the bottle together must be directly vertically above this point of support. Otherwise it would tip over. Here's another one. This little bird, I can balance it right on his beak. So I know the center of gra gravity of that bird is somewhere on the line, directly vertically in line with the point of support. In this case, it's most likely below, like the block that I hung from the nail. Here I've got a broom, and I'll put it on my hand, and I can balance the broom. I can feel which way the broom is going to tip, and I can adjust my hand to keep it underneath the center of mass of the broom. And as soon as I stop doing that, the broom tips over. This is similar to the way a rocket fires. As the rocket launches, sensors in the rocket detect if it's tipping side to side, and small rockets fire on the side to keep the center of gravity of the rocket over the thrusting force and keeps the rocket straight as it rises through the air. Another vocabulary word that we'll look at is the word stability. For something to balance, of course, like we mentioned, the center of gravity of the object has to be above the base. Not only this way, but also this way. And the higher up the center of gravity is, the less stable the object is. Okay? I'll still balance it on a thin edge, but I won't make it so high. Now I can, I can tap it. You'll see it wobbles a little bit, but it doesn't tip over compared to this. Just the slightest touch and it tips over. Of course, if I put it this way, that's going to be the most stable of all. The center of gravity is very low and the base is very large and I can't tip that over. Here I've got two plastic cups. The first cup is just a cup by itself. The second cup has a ping pong ball glued into the bottom of the cup. What I'll do is I've marked a black line on each cup and I'm going to take some water and I'm going to fill each cup up to the same level. So each cup will have the same level of water in it. Then I'll tip the platform and we'll see which cup tips over first. Which cup do you think will tip over first? Okay, so let's fill the cups with water up to the black line so that both cups have the same level of water. Now ask yourself which cup has the higher center of gravity? And remember, the higher center of gravity means less stability. So as I tip the board, and we see that the cup with the ping pong ball in the bottom had the higher center of gravity. Because down here where the ping pong, ping pong ball is, that space is filled with air. So more of the mass is higher up than in this cup. Here's a double-decker bus. At least when I get on a double-decker bus, I would like to sit on the top floor of the double-decker bus because it's for sightseeing, and that's where I can see all the sights much better. So it would be very probable 
that the first 20 people that got on the bus all want to sit on the top deck. So that causes the center of mass of the bus to raise fairly high and lessen the stability of the double-decker bus. Certainly when I ride this bus, I don't want to worry about it tipping over. And luckily, the bus driver and the bus company have the same concern. Here we see the testing of double-decker buses to ensure their safety. Back now to England for a look behind the scenes at the London Transport Works at Aldenham, Hertfordshire, to see just one of the demanding tests that buses have to undergo today to prove their roadworthiness. The buses are in fact as safe as houses, but for practical reasons, the main stability test is carried out with about two tons of sandbags strapped to the upper deck to represent 30 10 stone passengers. London Transport's 10,000 buses are completely stripped down and overhauled every three and a half years, although the stability test is only applied to one bus of each type, or a bus that has undergone any alterations. Notice that the bus is not secured in any way, and two rubber buffers on one side act as the only safety device in case the bus should tip over. The rig is operated by foreman Charlie Taylor, who's been working on bus maintenance since 1927. For the technically minded, the bus is tilted by a hydraulic ram of one and a quarter tons pressure. Ministry of Transport regulations stipulate that a double-decker bus must be able to tilt to 28 degrees without turning over, but the engineers test the bus to its limit. Worth remembering next time you grip the edge of your seat when the bus turns a sharp corner. The side dial indicates the angle of tilt of the chassis, while the front dial shows a body tilt of 34 degrees, illustrating the amount of spring deflection in excess of the chassis. Mind you, a bus wouldn't tilt like that going around the Leaning Tower of Pisa, but it's nice to know that it wouldn't tip over if it had to make the trip. If you're still not satisfied, let's conclude with a quick visit to the skid patch at Chiswick Works to show how, even in an uncontrolled skid, the bus remains upright. A tribute to perfect design and another guarantee of the safety of London's famous buses. Wir haben dann noch äh, die sogenannte kleine Steilkurve, die hat nur eine geringe Überhöhung. Auch die dient mal grundsätzlich dazu, dass wir die Geschwindigkeit aufrechterhalten können. Wir können aber auch hier sehr eindrucksvoll demonstrieren, ähm, wie groß der Kippwinkel bei unseren Fahrzeugen ist. Das heißt, ähm, bei Schrägen von über 30 Grad kippen die Fahrzeuge nicht, auch wenn man das erwarten würde, aufgrund des vermeintlich hohen Schwerpunktes. Ja. So we've shown that an object with a fairly wide base will not tip over until the center of mass passes the point of support. The center of mass, if it passes this point to the right, then the bus will tip over, just like the cups with the water in it. They will tip over when the center of mass passes the point of support. It's important to keep in mind that these analyses of objects tipping over, these are applicable to objects that are still and not moving. The situation is a bit different when, when the bus is going around a turn uh, and driving, but that is a more complicated analysis, which uh, we won't cover in this video. So here's a little bicycle that I've uh, constructed. I'll call it the Einstein cycle. And the Einstein cycle in this picture is balanced on a taut string. And I've added to the Einstein cycle this hanging mass. And the purpose of this mass is to lower the center of gravity of this entire object. Without this mass, the center of mass of the Einstein cycle would be somewhere up here above the string. But by adding this mass, I have lowered the center of gravity to be somewhere down here below the point of support or below the string. How does that affect stability? Let's take a look. 
When the Einstein cycle is not having the hanging weight, that puts its center of mass somewhere up here above the point of support. So we'll let this white dot represent the center of mass of the Einstein cycle, and the blue dot represent the point of support uh, for the cycle from the string. And the center of mass is always pulled down by gravity. So up here, it can tip either to the left or to the right. And once it begins to tip, that's it. Gravity is going to keep pulling it along the dashed line and is going to tip over. It will sway continually until it completely falls off the string. In order for it to stay on the string, it would be precariously balanced, keeping this white dot center of mass above the blue dot point of support, which could be very difficult. And even the slightest sway to the left or the, to the right would cause it to be unbalanced and tip over. However, if we hang the weight and lower the center of mass so that it is now below the point of support, now we can consider the center of mass to be hanging from the point of support. And if it sways or tips to either side, we see that gravity will want to pull it back to the lowest point. So if the Einstein cycle tips left, gravity wants to pull it back to the right and vice versa, so it maintains its stability. Let's see it in action. Okay, go ahead. Woohoo! All right. <laughs>